69. Counsel, would you like any rebuttal time? Uh, two minutes, Your Honor. <coughs> Go ahead. May it please the Court. Your Honors, uh, we're asking this afternoon that you invalidate my client's waiver of appeal in this case as it regards the youthful offender status issue as well as the post-release supervision issue. And I'm asking this for two reasons. First, the ultimate bargain for disposition in this case was not contemplated at the time that the waiver was executed. There was, in fact, a bargain for disposition that took place after the waiver was executed. Are you, is it, are you suggesting a general rule that when a, um, a defendant is offered an opportunity, when a plea bargain can't be kept, and the defendant is offered an opportunity to withdraw his plea, and he says, no, thanks, I'll stick with it, does he have to be allocated again? No, Judge. Our concern is that we have to have a – well, we have to have an allocution of the waiver again. There would have to be another why, waiver. Why, why, not, why not the rest of the allocution? Well, because we're not challenging the rest of the allocution. Well, no, but as a general rule, uh, well, yeah, suppose you were. Uh, yeah, suppose you said, oh, uh, he said, oh, I, I didn't understand the second time that I was, raised, that I was waiving my right to trial by jury. No, I, and I think in a situation like this, Your Honor, you already have the, the conviction entered. And if it's a youthful offender adjudication, you're substituting that conviction. So there's no reason to enter it under these circumstances again. You would just say the judge is not going to enter the adjudication and replace the conviction. Under these circumstances, no, I, I don't think. Does it matter that he's a, that he's a uh, Y.O. you know, or or a person, a younger person? Yes, Judge. And in, this, was, in this context. And, and that was the second reason why we're asking that the plea waiver be uh, vacated. That's a um, special rule then, by by age. Well, Judge, here's the problem. I, I mean, I'm trying to figure out what. What would the judge have anticipated? Because it sounds like you're saying the correct thing to have done here was for the judge. I presume that it was correct for the judge to ask him if he wanted his plea back, correct? Oh, yes, absolutely. So how would the judge also know at that juncture that he was supposed to reallocute the, the waiver. waiver of the appeal? Because it's, it's another bargain that's in place that was put on the record at sentencing. And if it's part of the bargain, which is what a is it Because it's a more is, severe sentence, or is it just that it's another different bargain. It's also that it's a different adjudication for, for several reasons. Right, but what about that bargain. it's more severe? Does that matter? It does matter, Judge, but the concern is that this part of the bargain for disposition has to include this element of an appeal waiver. And if that's not done when we have a new agreement put on the record, that's the agreement. <coughs> it doesn't include the new waiver. So, so you, you are suggesting a rule, I think, that every time uh, there's a an offer to withdraw the plea is reclined, declined, if there's an appeal waiver, you have, to, you have to waive the appeal again. If it's not contemplated at the first time that we deal with the appeal waiver, one, or, one part of our well, argument... Well, it's all, well so, I mean, it's, uh, in the nature of that situation, that you, you have a plea bargain, then, then a term of the plea bargain can't be kept, and so the defendant is offered a chance to withdraw his plea. Right. You're saying if there was an appeal waiver the first time, you've got to get it again. If that first time that we executed an appeal waiver we're not contemplating the issues that we want to waive on appeal. In other words, we had no idea. I'm sorry, Judge. Okay. Uh, no idea first, at the, at the plea, he thought he was going to get one a third to four plus Correct. YO, okay? Correct. And he went through the whole allocution and he allocated the, the plea waiver. Then the judge, at sentencing, he said, no, I can't give you one and a third to four. You're going to get five years plus five years uh, probation and no YO. Correct. And then you offered him to withdraw his plea. Correct. And he said no. He and, wants the um, plea. He wanted the Correct. plea. Um, he we, didn't have to reallocate to the conviction because he had already allocated to that. That's true. But under your rule, he would have to reallocate to the waiver of the right to appeal. Wait, because we have another agreement now, Judge. We have a new agreement. If I because now he can appeal the fact that he didn't get a YO. Is that is that yes, it? As well now as there's the another issue, that's a possible issue for appeal, as well as the or severity of sentence, that's another issue of appeal? Could be. We're, we're only attempting to appeal the post-release supervision issue and the youthful offender status. That's the only thing we're attempting to appeal. In a, in a different, slightly different fact situation, something similar occurs, and the judge says, I know you're asking me to give you YO status, but I'm going to wait and look at the pre-sentencing report, and I'm going to see what probation recommends. And then he takes the waiver of appeal. So there's no definite promise for the YO, which I think is generally what happens fairly frequently. What happens then? Do they have to take the waiver a second time? No, because at the time that that first waiver is executed, it's contemplated that it's possible 
I might be denied youthful it's getting kind of confusing, isn't it? <coughs> no, there was no chance under the original bargain that my client could possibly lose his youthful offender status. Not under the original bargain. The bargain changed, and now he Do lost you know where it. the judge changed your mind? No, Judge. And th that's why the, the question was asked by defense counsel by a letter. Before the pre-sentence report came out, the judge changed her mind, and I, I don't have a reason. There's nothing in the record. She talked about um, a serious injury, et cetera. I mean, that was, she knew that before. That's true. What about the scope? What about the scope of the waiver? Was that clear? Well, Judge, if you look at the allocution itself, if we could talk about that, we have three questions that are, or three statements that are posed towards my client. The first is, do you understand that a higher court is not going to be able to look at this case and determine whether there's any legal issues that or errors that led to your conviction? There's no response to that. And then we have another statement by the court. Um, this is not going to include certain issues like the plea being involuntary and the sentence being. Right. Then there's no response to that. And then we have the question, are you waiving your right to appeal? And then we have, yes, I do, stated by my client. What we're saying is that for this court to determine whether yes, I do equates to that first question, do you understand that no court is going to look at this again, this court has to treat the transcript kind of like a word puzzle. You have to start with the answer and work back and cherry pick and find the question to match it up, just like a child's word book you do that. And that's not what you're supposed to be doing with a transcript. You're supposed to look at it from the face of the record. You're supposed to determine that this young man understood the terms of this waiver of appeal. And getting back to the age. I, I understand that aspect of it, but wouldn't there be some other inquiries in the allocution that you could make the same arguments about? I suppose. Shouldn't Judge, he be asked, you know, if he was coerced? Absolutely. At that's that a, junk? So you really want another full allocution, don't you? Just on the waiver, you know what we want, Judge? We want answers to these questions. He's 17 years old. You've never dealt with this issue before. A 17-year-old with no priors. We need answers to these important questions. You can't just stand there like in Seberg. He, he didn't actually participate on the record in the appeal waiver, but he wasn't 17 with no priors. A 17-year-old with no priors, we need to hear from him. I want an answer to these important questions. Like, do you understand, uh, defendant, that this is a distinct event from the plea waiver itself. Do you understand? Well, they, did they even do that in the original? No, Judge. No, Judge. Or in Lopez. That, uh, oh, in Lopez, excuse me. Yeah. No, no, but here. What, was, was it distinct? Was it distinct? Yeah. Yes, it should have been distinct. Right. Absolutely. But it wasn't. Is that your argument? That, that is our argument. And yes, here, here, what you're saying is, regardless of what went on before, and that's why everyone's asking you about. What's the rule that if there's a new sentence, you have to have a new waiver that relates to that sentence every time, even if they offer to withdraw the plea? If there's a new bargain for agreement, yes. Because a, so that's the rule you're asking for. It's not a new rule, though, Judge. Even from Seabrook, it's always part of a, par a bargain for disposition. We don't just tell people to waive the right to appeal. So there's a new waiver. In the, if there's a, if it's new, a new bargain, bargain for <clears throat> you need a new waiver because it's a new bargain. What's the, what's the point, then? I mean, it, what, it, what would you see then happening going forward? He would appeal to the appellate division and say, uh, in your in, in the interest, they have interest in justice jurisdiction as well, I guess. And I, if I would, I'll address it when you're ready, Judge. I'm sorry. Yes. No, go ahead. Well, the, the whole thing about Lopez, that we don't want to have an orchestrated bargain undone as a matter of discretion on appeal, that fits right into our argument, because there's no bargain here with this waiver. So the court, the, the appellate division still does have interest of justice jurisdiction regarding this. And your thought would be, you know, we had a, we had a prior deal that we liked. that was a YO. The judge, for some reason, unbeknownst to anyone in the courtroom that I can find, and certainly not in this record, changed it. And now this, this young man who was going to have a YO and therefore would be able to protect this from future employers, et cetera, uh, is not able to do that. And we would like you, detached as interested magistrates in the Fourth Department, to, to reverse the, uh, 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 give YO status to this, to this defendant. Yes. And the, and the appellate division said can't do that because you waived it the first time when, when, right. when you thought you were getting YO. Right. That's okay. correct. And our point, of course, it wasn't contemplated at the time. Even if you want to apply that, wave, that first waiver, the only waiver, to the second bargain, the second different bargain, it wasn't even contemplated at the time. So People not getting the YO was not contemplated. Correct. It has to be a known right. If it's not a known right, it becomes a forfeiture. Only known rights can be waived. I want to just talk about the 17-year-old issue for a second. At the time that my client was said to have executed this waiver of appeal, New York State did not trust him to do many of the things that other adults are trusted to do. He couldn't smoke, he couldn't drink, he couldn't vote. 
he can't even enter into a contract. But what we're saying is that he's enough, he's sufficient enough on this record to enter into this contract, this bargain for exchange, where he's going to sign away several years of his life. Well, he had a lawyer. Circumstances. He had a lawyer. That's true, Judge. And you're not saying he was incompetent to make the contract. You're just saying that it had to be explained to him better. Better for this court to monitor it better. Answers to the important questions that, that are supposed to be asked. He can't just stand there. He's 17. You have to get his attention. It's not like any other case you've dealt with. A 17-year-old with no priors who had never stepped foot in a superior court before the arraignment on this matter. This is the if first time. If it was time. the same, if it was the same, uh, uh, well, it couldn't be exactly the same because there was no uh, Y.O., you know, at the beginning. But if it was a, a, if he wasn't 17 years old and there was a new bargain, you always have to reallocate the waiver? Yes, only because it has to be part of a bargain. It right, but it, you're saying it's particularly in this case, but it would be the same if it was a seasoned uh, veteran of the criminal court. Absolutely. And, but I pointed something else about this defendant. <coughs> Excuse me. But, but not if he had been told, I may not be able to give you what I'm telling you now. I'm willing to give you depending on, you know, what comes back on the probation. Then it would be contemplated. There, there'd be then some, it would be contemplated. There would be some sort of contemplation that perhaps you're not going to get the best scenario here. Mm -hmm. Hildago, Lococo, those are cases where they knew the sentence range to begin with. That's what we're talking about. They knew what could happen. This 17-year-old, by the way, Your Honor, keep in mind, what does he know about an appeal? When we, when we look at what everyone knows in general about uh, trial rights, when we say you're going to waive your right to all these issues at trial, not bringing witnesses in, this is much more complex, an appeal waiver, because we're saying two things to the person. It's this distinct and, and separate event, and at the same time, it's part of this bargain for plea agreement that's connected to the plea. This is a very complex thing we're asking this teenager to comprehend. And with this record, respectfully to this trial judge, she's going through the script. She's not even seeking responses to these important questions. She's making sure she makes a record. That was her goal here. Respectfully, I say that. If you take into account that the bargain completely changed, you take into account this is a 17-year-old with no priors, you take into account this very awkward allocution. Based on all these factors, we're asking that you invalidate this waiver, remit to the appellate division so that we can appeal these two issues. Okay. There's nothing further. Thank you. Thanks, Counsel. Counsel. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the Court. Sean Hennessy for uh, Erie County. Um, first and foremost, Your Honor, I, I would like to talk about the age of the defendant. Uh, counsel would have you believe that that's the all-encompassing issue here as far as him being 17 years old. Judge Piggott mentioned it, and, and I agree with his position in that he has an attorney here. What good is the Is attorney? it not relevant at all that he's 17 years old? It's not relevant, but it shouldn't be conducted in a vacuum either, Your Honor. Uh, I mean, it is relevant, but it should be conducted. It is, it is relevant, vacuum. but it's, it's not the all-encompassing. Um, what about his answer? argument about that the bargain changed? He, he was offered a chance to withdraw the plea. Yeah, yeah but, but what about the waiver? Is that, you mean you don't need a, if you, if you offer to withdraw the plea, you don't need to reallocate the waiver? Uh, yes, Your Honor. That's, that's a, the rule for, as far as you're concerned. That's exactly what I'm saying. There really isn't a case on as far as appeal waivers go and 260 right, but, 20 but the change let's, let's not talk about a case. Let's just talk about could there be a knowing waiver in this case? Forget the fact that he's 17 years old, other than that it, your adversary says that he wouldn't have contemplated not having a YO. Um, could it be a, a knowing waiver when the bargain changed and he didn't contemplate at the time he gave the original waiver uh, you know, that this might take place. Could it be knowing, and it doesn't matter that it's not knowing, as, I, long, I, as, as long as you were given the, the ability to withdraw the plea? I would harken back to the fact that he did have an attorney. The court, the, the court asked Mr. Harrington in this case, who was the defense Does attorney. Does the judge not have a responsibility to know that there's a, to, to ensure that there's a knowing waiver? I think the responsibility ends when you inquire with the, with the attorney himself. If you've explained everything and, and, and and found out and, and given a correct answer from the defense attorney that, yes, I explained Isn't this all it? again to him, and he wishes to avail himself of this new five-year uh, sentence. Henderson, is it possible that uh, whatever, whatever changed the judge's mind, and uh, let's take a situation where all of a sudden the victim is in the courtroom and the judge didn't expect that, and uh, so the judge does what the judge does here and changes the thing and doesn't mention the waiver because she wants to give him an opportunity to go to the appellate division and have them review the sentence. In other words, she didn't want a waiver the second time. 
It could be possible, Your Honor, but, but then again, I mean, why, why change a sentence in the first place, I guess? If, if she's because someone's in the courtroom and you're, and you're feeling a little bit of public pressure. And uh, uh, having spent a few, te- a few years in the appellate, but sometimes there's, there's, there's uh, sentences that come out of, the, out of the courts that you know the judge, you know, would not be offended if the appellate division made an adjustment. And I'm just wondering why, and this could partic- I'm not suggesting that's what happened here, but there's nothing in the record that indicates that Judge Wolfgang intended that there be a plea, that there be an appeal waiver on, on the second, on the second sentence. I don't think, quite honestly, Your Honor, I, I don't think the court knew or, or, or thought that the waiver had to be re-entered into. Well, in fact, the first time she didn't, she didn't insist on it, she said that you did. She said the people are asking. Well, it was part, yes, it was part. And of you it. didn't ask the second time. But it was part of the bargain for exchange. I, I guess what I'm saying, Your Honor, is there is a quid pro quo here. Uh, defendant, uh, defendant agrees to waive his right to appeal. The people don't take a position on sentencing, agree with it at that point. I believe it was one and one-third to four. Um, and, and, and the fact that, you know what, we're giving, they're giving up the right to appeal for that sentence. And I may, may also put in that uh, they were pleading to one count of a three-count indictment. So I guess that my answer is that's, that's the How is it a part that. of the second bargain for? I'm sorry, Your Honor. How is it a part of the second Bargain. How if it wasn't of, if it wasn't reallocated, how is it a part of the second? As Judge Pickett said, maybe maybe there wasn't even a waiver altogether. I would argue that by operation of the fact that you were allowed, you were given the opportunity to say, "Listen, I don't like this plea anymore." So it's all about okay. It, it's okay. all about two sixty twenty, and given the fact that you have an opportunity to get out of this plea if you do not like it, but, it was offered that, twice. That's that's not separable from the issue of a knowing waiver. I'm not sure I understand your honor. Once you, once you, uh, um, once you reject the withdrawal of the plea, then you go back to the, to the original waiver and it just holds. That, that's 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 my yes. That's Even my, if it wasn't within the contemplation of the defendant at the time of the first waiver that he might not be a YO. Uh, yes, your honor. Yes, because you are given the opportunity to say, I don't like this bargain anymore. I don't like what's happening here. I wish to get out he of it. He doesn't want to withdraw the plea. He just wants to appeal. Well, he, but he want, then he wants his cake and eat it too, Your Honor. And, and, and either you don't like it, you get out of it, and you proceed however you want to proceed, you go back to pre-plea status, or you avail yourself of that plea and proceed forward with the five years and, and the five-year post-release supervision. And that's what we're asking. Was the court aware when it took the first plea of the serious nature of the victim's injuries? I can't honestly answer that, Your Honor, but what I can say, and this is to Judge Piggott as well. But the record doesn't disclose if that was the reason I, I why the judge withdrew the Y.O. offer later on. If you look at page three of the sentencing transcript, she has a change of heart, and she talks about the seriousness of the crime. I think at some point maybe she reflected and, and thought, you know what, maybe one and a third to four years isn't enough for something like this. This was a teacher who was hurt. Her car was taken by this defendant who was a student who beat her with the board to take the car. And I think that's simply what it was, is that she had a change of heart and realized, you know what, maybe why it wasn't appropriate in this situation. It was a very violent crime on a teacher from a student. Was it five years the minimum she could give him as an adult? Twenty-five, Your Honor. Twenty-five, as far as non-YO status, she could have, I believe she could have given up to 25 years. So five years was the minimum? I, I believe five years was the minimum. I can't, I can't answer that specifically, Wait, but, what, it, but it's in the lower from, range. She went to the crime I'm sorry. Pardon me, Wasn't he a J.O.? I'm sorry. Wasn't he a juvenile offender? Uh, he was 17. I, 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 it could go either way, I believe. He, he, he was 17 at the time it happened, so, so no, actually he wasn't. Because if he was a juvenile offender, five years is about tops it out, doesn't it? I think four, it, under, under, the, under the UIO sentence, he no, was no, not top Y-O, four years. Jail. I don't think he was eligible for jail at that point in time, Your Honor. That's, that's this, it. this was his first arrest? I believe this is his first arrest, but he was 17 years old at the time. And, and I believe that makes a difference. There's any okay, other anything questions? else, Counsel? Uh, nothing else, Your Honor. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> counsel Rebuttal? Very briefly, Your Honors. Um, at uh, People versus Calvi, which is. Um, 89, New York 2nd, 868. It's the only parallel that I can make. I think it may explain this best. You have um, someone that's convicted after trial, and then there's a post-conviction agreement. And in the agreement is a written waiver of appeal. Um, And then you have a sentence, and nothing is mentioned about the waiver anymore. So you have the conviction event, you have a post-conviction agreement, and then you don't put anything on the record again at sentencing. 
It seems to be a direct parallel here. The closest thing I come up with a parallel from your case law. Um, very clearly, we have two bargains here, and I don't want to repeat myself, but it's not in the second bargain, and we would just rely on that fact, unless there's any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. Thank you.